for all the Zoom errors I make in advance. Hopefully there are very few. But. So I'm originally from South Africa. I went to the University of Witwatersrand, and one of the first classes I had was a biology class. Um, it's a long time ago, but I still remember the professor introducing a paper uh, by Jack Haldane that was written in 1926. And the title of the paper was Be On Being the Right Size. So already just the title was very intriguing to me. And in this paper, one of the things uh, that he said is, if you drop a mouse out of a building, it'll survive. If you drop a person, it'll be broken. If you drop a horse, it'll splatter. And what he sort of was trying to say is that animals on Earth have an optimum size. There is a maximum size that animals can be. And pretty much an elephant is about as big as you're going to get. Um, because it's so big, it needs to get oxygen all over its body to bring nutrients uh, in the blood and so on. So it needs big lungs, um, a big heart to pump all of this around. Whereas a small little animal, the oxygen can actually just diffuse from the surface. An elephant then also needs big, strong bones to keep itself going, it's eating all day. And so he had a mathematical formula which sort of related the surface area of an animal to the volume inside the animal and could actually model what would be the ideal size for an animal. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but if you think about it, you can take that same idea and look at mechanical objects. You can look at cars and airplanes. Um, you know, there's an ideal size for an airplane and there's a maximum size. If you get bigger than the biggest airplanes we have at the moment, it gets really, really hard to make them. You've got to use a lot of fuel to get them into the air. A lot of moving parts, lots of things can go wrong. And it's probably the same thing with organizations. If we think of organizations like governments, um, Google, Microsoft, big companies, there is an ideal Pfizer. There's an ideal size and a maximum size. And so one of the questions I ask in the book is, is there an ideal size for science? Is there a maximum science for sci size for science? And you know, are we reaching it? If you're thinking about the growth of science, science is growing faster and faster and faster, um, maybe even exponentially. Um, in the book, I have a section called New Science. And in New Science, I talk about CRISPR, which is gene editing, artificial intelligence, uh, gravitational waves, and optogenetics. Four hugely important fields. Thousands of people are working in each of these fields, but they weren't around 10, 15 years. So the science is, is really growing quickly and um, it has some consequences. One of the consequences is it's very easy for people to say, wow, there's so much science. Um, I can't understand it. I don't want to understand it. And so I'll just believe my own version of science. I'll believe that genetically modified organisms cause cancer, that vaccinations cause autism, or that the climate change is not real. Um, so that's one of the problems. Um, another problem is with science growing so fast, a lot of the science is really, really powerful and can do a lot of things. But with that power comes risk. And so the bigger and the greater the power, the greater the risk associated with it. So that might be another reason why there's a limit to the growth uh, of science. And then lastly, um, with so much knowledge and such complicated things to understand, the people who are really deciding how fine, uh, science should be funded and regulated, so people in Congress and so on, um, tend to have less and less science knowledge. In Congress at the moment, there are only three scientists. There are twice as many uh, talk show hosts, um, nearly three times as many farmers, and more than 60 times as many lawyers. So how can they decide how to portion out money towards science. Um, that's pretty difficult and sh they should be relying on experts. 
but today we're relying on experts less and, and less. So uh, what I thought I'd do in this talk is to, to think about these things is to give an example. And um, the example I'd like to give is CRISPR. So if I go and share my screen, So about two weeks ago, um, I woke up at 5.30 in the morning, like a good science geek, and I went to listen to the announcement of the Nobel Prizes in Chemistry. And this is what I heard. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry jointly to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the development of a method for genome editing. It was 5.30 in the morning, but I was I'm not quite jumping up and down, but I was ecstatic. It was really great to see this Nobel Prize for two reasons. One is that I'd written a chapter in my book about CRISPR, so it was cool to see it recognized. And the other was the two award winners. Um, two very deserving women getting a Nobel Prize in chemistry. If we go back in the history of the Nobel laureates, we'll see that in all of history, 617 uh, people were awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry, physics, and medicine. Only 3% of those were women. So the Nobel Prize really hasn't been doing a good job in um, looking at a diverse um, bunch of laureates. So having Schaffentier and Doudna win the prize uh, was very, very satisfying. But what I want to do is tell you a little bit about CRISPR and about Schaffentier and Doudna's role, and then of course lead you off to the question, um, should we carry on in this direction? Is maybe a bit there too much science and too much danger involved with CRISPR. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today. So a little bit after the announcement, um, Klaus Gustafsson, who is the chairperson of the selection committee, so he is the person who actually chose the two laureates, um, finished off a description of CRISPR, and this is how he finished it off. The enormous power of this uh, technology it means that we need to uh, use it with great care. But it's equally clear that this is a technology, a method that will provide humankind with great opportunities. So uh, this was one of the first Nobel Prizes that came with a warning label, right? Be careful, we shouldn't be using it indiscriminately. Um, in 2016, the, uh, oh, actually, uh, James Clapper, who is the intelligence um, director of, of the US for Barack Obama, uh, was asked to do an assessment of risks to the country. And in his assessment, he named six things that were concerning to um, the national security in, uh, complex. And the things that he mentions, most of them we could have all predicted. It was that China would get uh, more nuclear weapons, that North uh, Korea would start developing weapons of mass destruction, that Syria and Iraq would be uh, creating more chemical warfare agents. Uh, but then the sixth thing that he mentioned was CRISPR. So he said, what we really have to be careful of is genetic engineering. So I thought what I'd do is, is tell you a little bit about what CRISPR is, why it got the Nobel Prize, what makes it such a beautiful and potent technique but then also what makes us worried about how it can be misused. So the story starts in 1987 uh, with a Japanese researcher called Ashino. 
And what he did was he looked at E. coli bacteria. And in the bacteria, he found this strange repeating sequence uh, in the genetic information. It was a bit like as if he was looking in a book. And in the book, he found this one chapter. And in this chapter, what he found was there was a palindrome, six at noon taxes, for example. You can read it either way. And this palindrome was repeated over and over and over. And between each palindrome, there were always 32 words. So you would get six at noon taxes, 32 words. Six at noon taxes, 32 words. Six at noon taxes, 32 words. But this was just genetic code, but the same idea. And so Ashino said, well, this is really weird. I have no clue what's happening. I've never seen this before. And he published a paper about it. Um, a researcher in the Netherlands, Ruth Janssen, and one in Spain, Francisco Mojito, uh, they were both interested in this. And by the mid 2000s, early 2000s, it was a lot easier to sequence things. So they then sequenced lots of bacteria and found out that this was actually quite common. Not just E. coli, but most bacteria had this six at noon taxes, 32, six at noon taxes, 32. Um, they also found out that um, the 32 words had actually been stolen from other uh, bacteria. So it's like being stolen from other books and put into your book. So you would have six at noon taxes, a piece from another bacteria, six at noon taxes, a piece from another bacteria, repeating on and on like that. And that there was something associated with this, um, which cut genetic material. And so they called this repeating thing CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Quite a mouthful, but CRISPR is really sounds a lot better. So they came up with this idea that there's this genetic sequence and this uh, CRISPR associated protein called CRISPR associated the abbreviation is CAS that cuts things. Um, and they published a number of papers about that. And American scientists finally sort of caught on, hey, I know what this is. This is a bacterial defense system. So what the bacteria are doing is when they're attacked, and bacteria are constantly attacked, um, they snip a piece of the genetic material of the vanquished foe and keep it like a mugshot in their CRISPR. And then they take this CRISPR associated um, protein, which can cut genetic information, attach the mugshot to it, and then it goes patrolling throughout the bacteria, waiting for another bacteria with that same mugshot genetic material to attack it. And if it sees it, it knows, oh, I've accounted this and will cut its genetic material and it'll die. So basically what this is is a defense mechanism. So up to now, what we have is, is a story that's basically been basic research. Foundations had funded this because they wanted to know what was happening, why these bacteria were doing this. And at this point, the story takes a massive turn and becomes very applied. And so the first people to apply this was a big Danish yogurt company. Um, and it turns out that you get milk fermenting bacteria that make the yogurt. And these bacteria are attacked by other bacteria. And so the, the yogurt company thought, well, hey, what if we went and we knew all the bad actors here? We know their genetic code. And we put those segments of the bad actors into the mugshots of CRISPR. So then our milk fermenting bacteria know exactly what the bad bacteria and viruses are that they might come into contact with and know how to attack them. And this worked incredibly well. Now this is a big deal. Um, I've got the numbers here, I just can't remember them. Um, 1.2 billion kilograms of mozzarella cheese are made a year. A billion kilograms. 
and 620 million kilograms of yogurt, all using these genetically modified um, milk fermenting bacteria. It turns out that it's a market value of about $40 billion. So if you think that this little change of having CRISPR uh, increased the production by about 15%, now 15%, even if it's a small part of that 40 billion, that's a lot of money they saved there. Now, the strange thing is, of course, these bacteria stay in, in the yogurt. And so if you've eaten yogurt or mozzarella, um, chances are very good that you've eaten CRISPRized bacteria. Um, it's estimated that a billion trillion uh, bacteria are eaten by Americans every year. So that's a lot of genetically modified bacteria. So there were two researchers who were working on, one was on CRISPR, and that was uh, Jennifer Doudna at the University of California, and Emmanuel Charpentier was working on the uh, associated protein in UMA in Sweden. And they met at a conference in Puerto Rico and decided, oh, well, you know, since you're working with the cutting part and you're working with the DNA part, we should collaborate. And they started collaborating. And very soon they realized that, whoa, they had something incredibly powerful here. Because what you could do is instead of having the mugshot of another bacteria, you could put anything that you wanted to into that 32 word sequence. And then your CRISPR associated protein would go around your cell looking for that and cutting it. Uh, the best analogy by far is a word processor. So if you think about genetically editing uh, 10 years ago, it was like using a typewriter. And so imagine you've written this novel, it takes place in Nashville, and you've got an extra E in Nashville, or you're missing the E in Nashville. And you want to change all the Nashvilles. If it was all typed up, you have to go page by page, change it, sometimes the spacing will be missed. It's really very difficult. With a word processor, it's a lot quicker. And this is exactly what you can do with CRISPR. With CRISPR now, you can take a, a sequence and you put it in your CRISPR uh, DNA. Uh, it binds with the associated, um, well, it, it forms a complement then binds with the CAS and that goes hunting for the strand that you've now put out there and it'll cut it or it'll replace it with something. It can do pretty much everything you want to. 10 years ago, if you wanted to genetically modify a, I know, a ferret cell, and nobody else had genetically modified these ferret cells the way you want to, it would have taken you about five years and costed uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a whole PhD thesis. Today, you can do it with an undergraduate in a week for about $100. So that's how CRISPR has really changed things. Now, after they published a paper, Doudna and Carpentier um, went to the University of California and said, look, hey, we found this really cool uh, technique. It's gonna be very important. Can you put us in touch with your patent lawyers? They did. And the University of California uh, put in a patent. At the same time at MIT and the Broad Institute, um, Feng Zhang, a very famous chemist, was also working on CRISPR. And what he did is he took this idea one further and started looking at just human cells. And once he was done, he went to the Broad Institute and said, hey, let's get a patent. The Broad Institute said, okay, we'll pay extra money and we'll fast track this. And it turned out that even though their paper was published six months after the Doudna paper, um, they got the patent first. And in America, the Broad Institute patent, um, which is a bit like, so Doudna and Charpentier invented the word processor. Uh, Feng Zhang invented um, a word processor on a Mac. And inventing the word processor on the Mac got the patent for word processors. So it was a little strange, but in America, um, Feng Zhang got 
seems to be winning the lawsuit, whereas in the EU, Doudner and Charpentier are winning it. Now, I'm pretty sure had Zhang not applied for uh, the patent, he probably would have been the third person to get a Nobel Prize because the Nobel Prize can be awarded up to three people. So the fact that they awarded the prize just to two people is saying a lot. Um, they obviously are, are, are wrapping uh, MIT and Broad across the knuckles for saying, hey, this is not the way science is done. You, know, you knew that the University of California had done all this work. You knew they'd applied for the patent. Uh, and now you're applying for a patent in an underhand way. And so Zhang didn't get it. But what's also interesting is that they didn't give it to the people who were doing the basic research. So the people who found that this was a bacterial defense system didn't get it either. So, so there's sort of an interesting twist to it. Um, so what can you do with CRISPR? Why is it so important? Well, there are about 10,000 diseases, human diseases, that are caused by a genetic, genetic malfunction of just one gene. And so if it's just one gene, then it's at least possible to conceive of CRISPR fixing the disease. So one of, well, some of the diseases are diseases like sickle cell anemia, um, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease. So those are all just single gene mutations. And probably the most interesting one is sickle cell anemia. In sickle cell anemia, what happens is if a person has sickle cell anemia and they're exercising a lot, they don't get enough blood and the blood cells collapse into a sickle shape and can't carry oxygen around. And um, this can lead to people being out of breath very quickly. It can lead to headaches, can lead to organ collapse and early death. Um, so when a baby is, well, let's start even earlier, before a baby, in an embryo, uh, in an embryo, uh, the blood contains what's called fetal hemoglobin. This is a special sort of hem hemoglobin that is just found in the fetus and is really good at carrying oxygen. Once the baby is born, three, four months later, then um, the baby no longer uses that gene, that recipe to make fetal hemoglobin and makes adult hemoglobin. So with Victoria Gray, who has sickle cell anemia, um, what doctors and scientists have done is they've removed stem cells from the bone marrow, then taken it out of her body and in the lab using CRISPR, changed it so that she no longer makes adult hemoglobin. Instead, her body makes baby fetal hemoglobin, which is much, much better at carrying oxygen. And so then they do all of the CRISPR outside of the body, check that everything is right, nothing's wrong, and then inject it back in the body. Um, Victoria had been going to hospital about seven to 10 times uh, a year uh, for severe pain and breathing difficulties. With this, these transplants of these sick, uh, CRISPR cells, she hasn't been to hospital once uh, in, in a year and a half now. And they've started a trial with a second patient. So that's sort of one of the things that we can look at. Also, if you think of um, agriculturally, um, we can have plants uh, that are more efficient at photosynthesis, tomatoes that fall off the stalk a little easier. So there are all kinds of genetic modifications that you can make. And of course, I guess ultimately in the lab, it, it's a tool, it's a huge big tool that's used in labs all over the country by uh, tens of thousands of people. Uh, most of us probably by now have gone for a COVID test. Um, most COVID tests use a CRISPR system. Basically, instead of having a mugshot there, they have a mugshot of the uh, genetic code from the COVID virus. And then the CRISPR-associated 
protein goes around looking for that. And as soon as it finds it, it starts cutting it. But it's also set up that at the same time, it releases a fluorescent molecule. And that fluorescence is then picked up by the test. And if there's fluorescence, you know, oh, the only way it, it could be any fluorescence was if there was a segment of COVID um, RNA floating around. So there are many, many reasons why CRISPR won the Nobel Prize. So one of the reasons that there's a warning associated with CRISPR, um, and it, it turns out that I can think of three big problems. The first is an ethical um, problem. And so um, a lot of these genetic mutations will be done on babies or in the embryo, in the in vitro stage. And so this is done to somebody who has absolutely no say about whether they're going to be genetically modified. For example, the twins that were genetically modified in China, they were genetically modified uh, in vitro uh, to be resistant to HIV infection. Um, but you know, they obviously couldn't give consent for this genetic uh, transformation. So that's one concern. Another concern is obviously you're messing with nature and changing nature. Um, that, that could be concerning to many, many people. And certainly um, things like the CRISPR yogurt, uh, tomatoes that have been genetically modified, at the very least, we should have a label saying, hey, this has been genetically modified. But then there are some bigger issues. Um, at the moment, medicine is all about treating the ill. But with CRISPR, medicine is going to be more about making the healthy and the rich better. Um, because just like there are thousands of single gene changes uh, that can lead to disease, there are also thousands of single gene changes that can lead to more healthier, better people. There is one gene that improves endurance, one gene that leads to stronger bones. Um, there's a, a gene, one of my favorites is called ABCC11, um, that reduces the underarm odor, uh, odor that people have and changes the earwax that people have. So what we're gonna get with this is a sort of um, probably medical tourism to countries where they do CRISPR improvements in humans. Uh, and we'll see the rich people not only having a better life, but actually becoming better and their children becoming better. And people going for system upgrades, much like you upgrade your um, Apple iPhone, you'll be able to upgrade um, some genes. So that's still far in the future, but it's, it's definitely something that we should be thinking about. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, is something called a gene drive. And let me just share my screen here. And so normally when you have a genetic trait, um, that trait follows Mendelian genetics. And so here, for example, you see a fly, fruit fly with a gene for something red, and you can see one in four of the fruit flies of its off, well, actually, in this case, half, half of the offspring will be red and half will be blue, and then it'll mate with another wild type, and everything here is blue, everything here is red. But with a gene drive, it's like sneaking a word processor virus into your word processor. So what happens here is this fly not only has a gene for being red, it also has a gene that says, hey, whenever you or your offspring find a gene that isn't red, just cut it out and replace it with red. So all this fly's offspring, whenever there's some genes from the blue, 
it just cuts out that gene and replaces it with the red. And there have been calculations if the first fruit flies in which these experiments were done had escaped. Um, they were done on eye color. All the fruit flies in the world by now would have a changed eye color. So what do you want to use a gene drive for? Well, there's some diseases like um, malaria. Malaria is carried by an Anopheles mosquito. And what you could do, and in fact, this is about to be done in Burkina Faso by uh, Imperial College, so an English university doing this in a poor African country. What they want to do is release genetically modified mosquitoes, males that have been genetically modified so that when the female that they've mated with lays eggs, all the female eggs will hatch, will become larva, but will be sterile and will never grow into full, fully grown mosquitoes. All the males that uh, eggs that are laid will become males. These males will be fertile, but the offspring will never, if they're female, will never develop further than the larval stage. So basically what you're doing is the same little scheme I've got here, but all the offspring will only be male. And so the idea here is you've got a, a really good and um, exclusive pesticide, uh, because if you have an Anopheles mosquito, that mosquito is only going to reproduce with other Anopheles mosquitoes. And you'll collapse the population of Anopheles mosquitoes. They've done this on small little islands. They've done this in cages but now they want to release them in nature. But of course, this is really the first time that we can really mess with evolution. We can actually direct evolution the way we want because we can change things and then we can say, okay, but let's not follow Mendelian genetics. Let's follow a gene drive where your trait is expressed in all the offspring and the offspring thereof. And so you can change uh, organisms. And this is great if it's done for an Anopheles mosquito or for mice that carry Lyme disease. Um, but this can, you can see, very easily be misused. So I hope what I've shown you is, is that we have this technique that's incredibly potent, um, but also has incredible risks to it. And I think I could give you an identical talk about artificial intelligence or optogenetics and show you really cool uses and really scary dangers. So what I wanted to do to, to finish off is just to give you some quotes from some of my favorite scientists about this. So this one's a really old one. Marshall Nuremberg, who got the Nobel Prize in 1968, said, that when man becomes capable of um, instructing his own genetic code, he must refrain from doing so until he has sufficient wisdom to use this knowledge for the benefit of mankind. And so there are two things that I really like here. First of all, of course, this is in 68, foreshadowing what's happening and saying that we have to be mature enough to be able to use this. Um, and the other thing is I uh, like when man becomes capable for the benefit of mankind, really this is 1967, and that the two people who made this happen were not two men, but were two women. So I think that sort of also adds a nice twist to, to this quote. Um, the next quote is obviously one uh, from Jennifer Doudner, um, who got the Nobel Prize. And she says, what will we, a fractious species whose members can't agree on much, choose to do with such awesome power. And then one last one here um, by Kevin Esfeld, he's at MIT and he is working on gene drives, especially gene drives uh, that work on ticks and uh, mice to try and um, wipe out Lyme disease. And so he has both views here. One is there's always a cost to doing nothing. And we need technology not just to keep, up, keep the world running, but also to make it better. And of course, we see that with sickle cell anemia, right? People are suffering. Um, about 50,000 uh, people in America have sickle cell anemia. 
So if we can cure that, that's huge. But his greatest fear is that something terrible will happen before something wonderful happens. It keeps me up at night more than I would like to admit, he says. Um, so I grew up in South Africa in a town which was completely flat. There, there were no hills, let alone mountains. And maybe that's why I, I liked reading books about mountain climbing. My favorite authors were Chris Bonington and Reinhold Messner. And I was fascinated by George Mallory. And so I started um, with the, talking about on being the right size from 1926. And this is an article from 1923. So I thought I'd end with 1923. And George Mallory was asked by the New York Times, why climb Mount Everest? And he said, because it's there. This was in March 1923. In 1924, he went up Everest um, with a climbing companion and was never seen again. Um, 1999, Mallory's body was found 100 meters from the top. Nobody knows if he actually made it to the top or not. Um, but I wonder if what he would think about going up Everest, if he knew that he was going to die on his way up or down, and that 100 years later, um, people would be basically, rich people would be ported up the hill, and this is um, pretty much 100 meters from the top of Everest. So what would he have thought uh, about that? So that sort of leads me to this question I started with. Um, is science the right size? Should science continue growing? And I have to say, I, I, I'm of the firm opinion that science should carry on growing, that we should carry on doing scientific research. But I, th I think there are some mountains that we should like, leave unclimbed. Um, and leave them there for our children uh, and leave them in a pristine condition. And maybe germ editing, maybe gene drives are things that we should just leave aside. And then lastly, I just thought I had to say thank you for listening and um, give you a little picture of the cover of my book, The State of Science. And um, open up to questions, see if any people have anything to ask, to say, comments. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I, I was going to ask you too, would you prefer that people write into the chat or just go ahead and um, ask their question, you know? Let me see. Okay. Um, and in a follow-up email, I'm going to send a link to Mark's book as well for anyone else who's um, interested. But um, if anybody has questions, feel free to just unmute and ask. Um, we do have one. I just want to say, Mark, um, I thought your talk was so clear. And for the first time, I think I've understood, well, that's saying a lot, but I, I've managed to gain a tiny insight into this word CRISPR that we've heard a lot about and now you have clarified for me a little bit what what it means so thank you well, i'm so glad Candace, i'm not sure if you're asking um yeah but i was getting some feedback there did uh, you didn't hear it mm -hmm. um so i will i will make my comment um mark i work in hospice and we have talked in recent years the physicians in our state um i'm in new hampshire but i'm a member in connecticut <laughs> i have a house there too anyway um talked about how death has become a different thing because medicine modern medicine has delayed illness cured cured or delayed the progression of illnesses and it can have secondary problems with people having 
other illnesses happen as a result of treatment or live longer than they can afford to. We, we haven't solved all the societal problems that go along with that. And one of the quotes I heard a few years ago was something like, it's not just about curing people anymore, we can make people better. And you just help me understand what that means in terms of the genetic changes that are possible. So thank you for that. Well, it's actually, so um, Noah Yuval Harari, uh, really I love his books. Um, he sort of said that we might be creating a new species, Homo superior. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's really far away, um, but that is a possibility that, that people will just be able to, you know, they'll be operating 6.7, whereas most of us are operating system 2.1. So, but you also linked it to who will be able to afford that, right? So yeah. it's going to cause more societal layers and, yeah. Yeah. And so, the, the other problem you spoke about is society, right? I think society is growing at a certain pace, but science is growing at a much faster pace. Mm -hmm. And so society can't keep up with things. And scientists really aren't educated to keep up with the moral, ethical, and dangerous aspects of things right we we basically train to be scientists mm. and don't quite know how to deal with all these other issues mark isn't it true that every generation comes up with its own uh, theory about this scientific progress being you know a good and evil thing i mean nuclear bombs nuclear energy was a bad thing even before that i think tesla talked about the dangers of electricity and even before that, probably there was Aristotle and everyone had, had some problem with science at some point about science being a danger as well as a good thing for society. And this debate has been going on for two generations, right? Definitely. But I think... But no, it has not stopped science and so far we, have, we, haven't, we are still here. So it hasn't stopped science, but because of science, we've had Chernobyl, we've had Fukushima, we've had Nagasaki, Hiroshima. We've had uh, climate change. And I think with each iteration, science is getting more powerful. And so the risk associated is getting bigger. This is the first time ever that somebody can make a mistake and actually wipe out a whole species. That's never been possible before, right. even with a nuclear bomb. So I think every time the technique becomes more powerful, the consequences are bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nothing new. There's definitely, it's been around and it's a problem that people have had to deal with. Right. And yeah, it's like Groundhog Day. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Uh, that was, um, this is Roger Brooks. It was really great, good to see you and listen to you. Um, how long is it going to be before someone weaponizes uh, gene drive uh, manipulation and not accidentally wipes out species but decides to do things like let's do away with anyone who has uh, brown skin or yeah so i mean something like that would be quite difficult um but certainly somebody could take a bacteria and make that bacteria more virulent. Um, they are biohackers. So part of the book is about um, doing science yourself. And there's somebody uh, on YouTube and on Facebook who has injected himself with a CRISPR system with a myostatin rep uh, repressant. That means he make more muscles in his arms. And he actually, on, on Facebook, you know, scrapes up his arm uh, and injects himself with a virus to do this. Uh, and sells the kits. Now, the kits are mainly used by dog breeders and, and horse breeders at this point. But it's not going to take long before somebody like that goes out. Or that, um, you know, you know, in some country that needs a little money, they start doing medical tourism for upgrades. But yeah, it can also go for terrorism. So a disgruntled grad student even. Um, 
Mark, I wanted to read a few um, questions and comments from the chat as well. Um, so Steve asked a question, how can we possibly leave a mountain unclimbed, so to speak, when we have all the tools and the equipment to climb it? Um, and then a few thank you is very interesting. And um, Candice also commented, appreciated the explanation on CRISPR, read Carl Zimmer's book and didn't understand it as well. Um, Nuremberg's quote reminded me of Einstein's warning regarding the splitting of the atom. Yeah, so it's just like Jay said, right? The, the, this is, we're going through the same sequence, but I think the sequence is coming faster and it's amping up because, just because science is growing so much faster. Um, that means the good will be so much better, but it can also mean the bad can be so much worse. And I think um, with COVID right now, we've sort of not shown ourselves in the best way that we're not dealing with science very well. So having such a powerful method is probably not such a great thing. Does anyone else have any other questions? Um, if not, Mark, I was just going to ask one thing. I was interested in um, this kind of patent dispute you talked about between, um, I think you said the Broad Institute and MIT. And um, I was wondering if you might kind of talk a little bit about like how, how are profit motives sort of complicating the story of like how science is practiced or leading to bad outcomes or making difficult, you know, and not in any depth, but I just wondered if you had more um, thoughts on that. So the interesting thing here is that the scientists, so on the one side, Charpentier and Doudna, and the other side, Zhang, um, have been together on panels and, and they seem to have a good relationship. It's the universities um, that have put in for the patents and especially the Broad Institute has been quite aggressive on this. So um, yeah, at one point in, initially they were talking about billions of dollars uh, but it's since turned out that this CRISPR associated protein Cas9 uh, that there are others and so you can get around the patents now and so a lot of the thing that people have thought about that that would you know bring a lot of money hasn't brought a lot of money and um, what's going to bring money is going to be um, medical applications i don't know how to turn that off so applying uh, medical applications and things like that, companies that are doing that, diagnostics. Um, Jennifer Doudna has a really cool CRISPR test now that's going to be a game changer um, that is being checked by the FDA right now. And basically, uh, with all the CRISPR tests right now, what they do is they break it open the virus, well, if all the cells in the gunk that they get out your nose. So all the genetic material is there. Then they use polymerase chain reaction, chain reaction to make millions and billions of copies of it. And then they go and look using a, a probe to find out if there's any CRISPR genetic material. Well, with Doudna's new method, you don't do that. You just take the gunk. You have a CRISPR with a CRISPR cast that goes and looks for COVID. When it finds COVID, it lights up. And you don't have to multiply it, which is the time step. So this is a test that takes 15 minutes, um, is as accurate as the PCR test, but even better, the intensity of the light tells you how many viruses, the viral load. So you can tell in a test where in the infection cycle somebody is and how infective they are, because you can tell how many viruses they have. So with the current tests, with all the tests, all they can tell you is you're positive but they, they can't tell you the viral load. So this is going to be a really cool test that's going to be really quick and give us more information. Thank you. Um, and then I guess, you know, last call. Um, oh, I'm sorry, actually, someone did say something in the chat. Um, and it was about um, thoughts on politics using science as a tool or a weapon or on science in an uninformed public uses for manipulation. Oh, so totally, right. So science is being used by all sides 
and, and misused. Um, I actually have an ex-student of mine who got a PhD at the University of Chicago in the psychology of climate change denial. And she works for a think tank and, and basically looking in why people deny climate change. And it, it, it's a cultural outlook and it, it's part of their identity. Science really has nothing much to do with it, unfortunately. And it's the same with vaccine. Um, libertarians don't want to get vaccinated because it goes against their belief um, and their liberties. So science can be used in many, many ways and misuse and science denial, uh, of course, uh, we see that in news all the time. And especially with something like COVID, um, the consequences can be pretty drastic. And so there was a really interesting um, study done on social media, looking at over a million tweets. And what they found was that before COVID came to countries, there was actually a wave that was spreading just like the pandemic of misinformation. So while COVID was still in China, Italy got misinformation, then we got misinformation. And then in some countries that misinformation disappeared. And in those countries, COVID has really been kept under control fairly well. But in other countries, the misinformation just carried on going up. And it was mainly because the government itself was putting out conflicting information, information that didn't jibe with medical people. So in Germany, in South Korea, in New Zealand, what you found was the spokesperson was actually a scientist. And they spoke for the government. And in both those, I mean, all three of those countries, um, COVID went down. Um, misinformation and with Bolsonaro, Trump, uh, Johnson, um, yeah, the misinformation went up and COVID went up as well. So uh, there really is a, a sort of link between the two. Um, I see a question about climate change. I think one of the really interesting things is that the COVID outbreak is actually um, a bit like a precursor and of what we're going to see with climate change. Um, not half as bad, climate change is going to be a lot worse. And I think with what's happening with climate change is all these changes are coming very gradually. It's a bit like a frog in warmer and warmer water until it boils, it stays in, in, in there. Whereas uh, COVID has come very, very rapidly. And so um, I think that's one of the big differences. But in order to do something about climate change, we're going to have to change our lives a lot more than just wearing masks. So I think this has been a, a good sort of trial run for that. Yeah, climate change wasn't always a partisan issue. Um, that's definitely true. Um, do you, uh, part of Jocelyn's question was, um, do you think scientists are doing enough to communicate their science enough to educate the general public? Well, I think so. That's why this work that Kim, a student of mine, is doing very, is very important. Uh, I think scientists are being ignored. Uh, and so scientists really um, have to find a way of talking about climate change uh, in a way that doesn't antagonize the people who don't believe in climate change. Um, so um, they have to talk at gun shows, in churches, in, in, in reach out to people um, who are ready to talk to them in a different way and maybe try something like that. But definitely, I don't think scientists are doing enough, but I, I, I think probably Media is more to blame than scientists, would be my guess, and then politics. But then maybe that's because I'm biased. Hey, Mark, it's Manju. Hey, Manju. Thank you for a fantastic talk. You had my whole family uh, totally riveted. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I think to me, the bigger problem is not that we're not telling people about the science. I feel like what we're saying is economically uh, less viable than the way we're going at the moment. And so, or, or it may cost more and hence the reluctance on, on policymakers and politicians to, to make that leap to, to do something significant. Is there any way that you can think of that we can address that? And I mean, I know that's a difficult question, but if, if I knew how the, do we do that? Be screaming it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. Basic uh, climate change, I think, is the biggest issue. Right? COVID is, is just a small little side bump on the road. Climate change is the big thing that we're going to have to face, and that's going to involve a substantial change in the way we live, and more going to become more sustainable, using less fossil fuels, traveling less. But um, I don't know how to convince people to start this earlier rather than later. Well, I, I'm wondering if scientists pool their expertise with economists and you know like I, I feel like I feel like um, if we could have multiple people from different sectors of the economy and society coming together to make this case we have a lot of voice maybe has that has that been done like is there any attempt at all of course yeah 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 okay. there definitely are yeah. groups that are trying to do that and right Okay. Yeah, definitely. And also, there are a lot of um, funds out there that you can invest in that um, do the same thing. You know, they have no fossil fuels and they go for green chemicals. Right. They have to make a fair amount of profit. So there are a lot of crossovers with scientists, with journalists, with economists um, and politicians. Yeah. Still not being heard, though. <laughs> Still, well, I mean, it's always easier to hear the louder voice yes. at the table yes. than the methodic, correct voice. And I think that's one of the problems is that scientists tend to think in a sequential, methodic way mm -hmm. and not in an argumentative, um, complex in a more complex rather than a simple system. Right. Well, thank you. Oh, hi, Manju. I just wanted to say that uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, science and economics getting together, the most important thing that people should realize is that the cost of not doing anything for climate change is so high that it, you know, no matter how, how expensive it is to do something about it, the cost of not doing it is so high. As we've seen for COVID, I mean, by, 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 by messing up our response to COVID, the US economy has suffered so tremendously, right? Regardless of what, whether we listen to scientists or not, I mean, the economy has suffered so much. And if people had realized that earlier on, maybe even the, the most ardent of deniers would have believed that. Yeah, I, I think you, it's unfortunate, but you have to look at China yeah. and see it, the, the success of, of the way they handled it. Exactly, yeah. Um, it's not very democratic, but it certainly worked. Uh, Mark, and then there's, uh, I, I think this will be our, our last question here. Someone had asked in the chat, how do people tell if it's um, a credible scientist rather than fake scientists or qualified, or, you know, you see lots of um, different articles from different places. Do you have um, tips on that question? I've just submitted a, a book for a young adult audience on just this topic, um, how to distinguish fake science from real science with 20 rules um, there. But I, I think the best thing is to find yourself a bunch of credible sources. And once you have trust in those, just look at those sources. So um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter and, and follow a bunch of epidemiologists and virologists. 
that over time I've, I've become to, to trust. Um, Ed Young, he's a journalist for The Atlantic. He writes incredibly well and he does incredibly thorough pieces, another person that I trust a lot. Um, yeah, if it sounds too good to be true, often you should look again. If um, instead of quoting experts, um, patients are quoted or something like that, that's always a red flag. Um, so, but yeah, I, the, the, by far the best thing is to try and rely on science and nature. I used to say the FDA and CDC, but I'm not really saying that any, as much anymore. Um, so science and nature, and then people that you just learn to trust with time.